my Lord and my God. I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. This glorious feast of the Assumption is a day to melt, to be especially tender with Our Lady. After all, Mary is our mother, and for that reason she is irresistible. Jesus, we can only imagine how much this feast means to you. Granted, there are dozens of magnificent depictions of Mary's Assumption, in which she appears so majestic. She is the woman clothed with the sun, the moon beneath her feet, a crown of twelve stars on her head. Although we admire those masterpieces of art, we are drawn to Our Lady simply because she is our mother, and she is so very close to us. St. John Paul II put it in this way, Motherhood always establishes a unique and unrepeatable relationship between two people, between mother and child, and between child and mother. Even when the same woman is the mother of numerous children, her personal relationship with each one of them is of the very essence of motherhood. Mary, on this feast day of yours, show us what it means to believe. Guide us along our pilgrimage of faith. Way back in the 1960s, Cardinal Ratzinger explained faith in his classic work, Introduction to Christianity. He wrote, Much is contained in that tiny word, Amen. Trust, to entrust, fidelity, firmness, firm ground, to take a stand, truth. This means that the thing on which man can finally take his stand and which can give him meaning, can only be truth itself. That is a powerful litany of characteristics of faith, trust to entrust, fidelity, firm ground. We just think what we did a few minutes ago in the introductory prayer when we said, I firmly believe. What happens when we live a life of faith? Well, our life becomes filled with meaning, trust, and joy. We acquire the capacity to see through difficulties and not get bogged down by them. But how does a life of faith begin? Well, essentially, by listening to God's message. In the case of Mary, her pilgrimage of faith began in Nazareth when she listened to the message delivered by the Archangel Gabriel. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Faith leads to self-giving. Mary listened with astonishment to God's plan for her and responded by entrusting herself to God completely. Her response to Gabriel was, Behold your handmaid, be it done to me according to your word. In essence, she said to God, Do with my life whatever you want. The perfect term for this attitude is abandonment. St. Josemaria referred to this response of faith when he wrote, Do you want it, Lord? Then I want it. And elsewhere he said, How little a life is to give to God. Speaking of firmness and certitude, Pope Emeritus Benedict wrote in 2011, Only through believing 
does faith grow and become stronger. There is no other possibility for possessing certitude with regard to one's life apart from self-abandonment in a continuous crescendo into the hands of a love that seems to grow constantly because it has its origin in God. This is a powerful phrase. There is no other possibility for possessing certitude with regard to our life, apart from self-abandonment in a continuous crescendo into God's hands. Jesus, we ask for that right now. We would do anything to obtain that certitude with regard to our life. And so we turn our life over completely to you, placing it in your hands. Faith leads us to let go, to embrace God's ways, which at times are mysterious and sometimes seemingly contradictory. Mary's pilgrimage of faith was filled with abundant light, but also darkness. Those years in Nazareth, living in the presence of Jesus, were a constant source of joy. But don't forget, those ominous words of Simeon in the temple, Behold, a sword shall pierce your soul also. Mary could never forget those ominous words. This great mother of ours is intent on teaching us to be souls of faith. For that reason, she will lead us to become souls of prayer. St. Luke offers us this powerful explanation of Mary's faith. And his mother, the mother of Jesus, carefully kept all these things in her heart, pondering what those words might mean. Our faith must be nourished through daily prayer. At times, reading God's word in the sacred scriptures and pondering those words. For example, take the gospel for this feast. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. As we dwell on those words, it might well be that the Holy Spirit will show us how to trust more completely in God's love for us and in his plans for us. Take this charming consideration from a helpful website that you may have discovered called To Pray With The Gospel. How lovely to find Mary following Jesus, to imagine her listening to him, paying attention to every word, to every story, his gestures, his smile, as a thirsty soul, drinking every word that came from his lips, smiling to herself on hearing that voice that she knew so well. She had her eyes on him every time she had the chance. Even when Jesus was talking to someone else in the distance, she could not help looking at her son and recalling so many conversations with him. At the very beginning of this time of prayer, we were considering our desire to treat Mary today with even more tenderness than usual. It might help us to consider a very charming story that took place unless I'm mistaken, in Ivory Coast, not that many years ago. One day, a florist was surprised to see a young boy enter his store and walk right up to the counter. This boy was so young that the florist had to peer over the counter just to make eye contact. The little boy plunked the equivalent of 25 cents on the countertop and said that he wanted to purchase the most beautiful orchid in the whole store. It was for his mother. The florist, who was very kind and quite charmed by this young one, said, wait right here. He went to the back room and came back with a very beautiful orchid and said to the boy, I think your mother will like this very much. The boy went home, walked in and handed the orchid to his mother. 
In the meantime, the father of that young boy stared at this, went racing back to the florist shop, asked the florist what had transpired. And when he found out that the boy had paid 25 cents for that gorgeous orchid, the dad said, Sir, I'm here to pay the balance due. The florist looked at that man and he said, Your son has taught me a wonderful lesson of what it means to love. So that orchid is on the house. But we have basically the equivalent of five cents. We turn to the Blessed Trinity. And we say, please, give to my mother today the very best possible orchid that has ever existed. This is all I have, but please. We know the Blessed Trinity will be thrilled. Our Lady will be thrilled with this desire of ours. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations that you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help in putting them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.